welcome again to another explanations videos. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, and today we've got a, another question that's come from the uh, the interwebs. Uh, and this one here is actually, this is for Belinda. So thank you very much for the question, who wanted to know a little bit more about the, the connection between what's going on with the health of your neck and digestion. So oftentimes when we think of issues associated with the neck, we think of headaches or we think of um, neck pain or shoulder pain or different kinds of things like that. But digestion, there's actually a few very, very interesting links that are worth talking about here. Now, I'm gonna take a little step back because when we're talking about digestion, and you know what, as important as the upper neck is, I'm always gonna to wanna to start with diet. And when we're referring to diet, yes, we have the obvious kinds of things that we can think of. Are we eating something that's gonna be producing inflammation in our body? Too much sugar, junk food, Lots of greasy stuff, stuff with lots of preservatives, stuff with lots of additive, things that produce leaky gut syndrome that ultimately manifests in and through the body, producing indigestion, producing any myriad of digestive issues, whether it is with your esophagus, so heartburn, things along those lines, whether it is bloating, whether it is constipation, whether it's diarrhea, it can show up any number of different ways. So it's always important, first and foremost, that we have a good understanding about what we are putting into our body, whether or not this is actually going to be good for us. So these are some of the, the obvious things, but I also need to, to pick on a few of the not so obvious things. And I need to explain just a little bit as it relates to inflammation of the digestive tract. So your digestive tract, along the inside, there are what are called epithelial cells. You don't need to know the fancy details or anything like that, and I'm not gonna to pretend to be a nutritionist or naturopath or a gastroenterologist, but I can tell you from understanding a basic anatomy that they are cells, not unlike the kinds of cells that make up your skin, that are meant to form semi-permeable junctions like this. And they have a very, very high turnover rate. In other words, your body's always producing more of them. Well, why is that? Well, if you think of your body in many ways as a tube from one end down to the other, that it means that there's always gonna be a certain amount of abrasion and there's gonna be a certain amount of sloughing and renewal. And so you're gonna have a continuous turnover of these cells like this. Now we could appreciate then that if you are putting something into your digestive system then that is not good for you, that it's going to be producing more irritation and those cells are not going to like it. And what can happen then is they can start to become a little bit more permeable like this. And that's not something that you can routinely see on a uh, endoscopy or a colonoscopy, uh, colonoscopy unless you are talking about huge amounts of damage. So you can have this initial opening and this leakiness of the digestive tract. If it's low grade, then what happens is as opposed to these little noxious substances just passing through you, what they can do is they can start to leak into the interstitium. And this is the fluid faced, me uh, fluid filled medium that is around your digestive system and that ultimately is contiguous with all of the other parts of your body. In other words, stuff can start to leak through where it is not supposed to go. And so when it comes to these kinds of substances, it is anything that your body doesn't like. I already hit on some of the big ones, the preservatives, the too much sugars, all that sort of stuff. But I'm also gonna pick on other types of protein stuffs. And this can come from either animal sources or also from plant sources. And the reason I'm saying this is because if you start looking for, you know what, I need to find the one dietary protocol that's gonna be right and it's gonna work for me. Again, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian, but I can tell you that probably in no other arena of the health and medical sphere do you have more divergent opinions about what we should or should not be putting into our body. On one end, you've got people who say you should be pure vegan. On the other end, you have people who say you should be pure paleo or carnivore. 
So where is the, the happy medium? And the irony is, is that most of the extremes, at least the one thing that they agree on is that we should not be putting abnormal stuffs into our body. The point nevertheless then is that each and every one of us has different sensitivities through our combinations of our blood type, through combinations of environmental exposures for different things that we have developed allergies towards. Again, typically towards different kinds of protein substances. So some people, grass seed. Other people might be dairy. Other people, it might be a certain kind of meat protein. Other people, it might be a certain kind of, you get the idea, fill in the blank, it's potentially infinite, is the short of it. Now the thing about this is, is that you can actually put something that is normally a quote unquote health food into your body, but if the cells of your body perceive it as being damaging, when you put that in, it's gonna produce an inflammatory and also trigger an immune response. And with that, what you're characteristically gonna notice is that I feel worse after I eat fill in the blank. And the thing about it is that we as human beings, unfortunately, we're very, very good at ignoring the signs and symptoms. Interesting thing about humans, we're the only animal that I'm aware of that will intentionally put something into our body that we know is bad for us. Alcohol, prime example. And I'm not saying I'm a, a saint by any stretch of the imagination, but alcohol is not good for human physiology. It produces and is a, a local irritant which increases some of the permeability. And yes, there may be actually, believe it or not, some different kinds of uh, therapeutic benefits where alcohol can be a good thing. Um, but in the same breath, of course, too much of uh, even a good thing is ultimately gonna be bad. So nevertheless, if and when we put something that's into, or going into our body that does not agree with our own system, it can produce that low grade inflammation to where we're just not feeling quite on point. And if that starts to accumulate over time, well, guess what's gonna happen? It means it's gonna manifest in terms of our dietary markers going up for generalized inflammation. It means also that we are gonna have a tendency to accumulate fluid. It means that it has the tendency then where we start to gain adipose tissue because adipose is the body's protective way of storing the gunk that's gotten into the system one way or another when it's not able to eliminate it. Why? Because it's still going in, unfortunately. And it's also gonna show up then in terms of dysregulation of our neuroendocrine system. And if you start mucking around with your endocrine system, that is your hormones, that's gonna to start to manifest in all kinds of abnormal symptomatology that I cannot even begin to elucidate. So what's my point in this? My point is, is that when people are diagnosed with different pathological conditions, whether it is a thyroid issue, whether it is an adrenal gland issue, whether it's in a digestive issue, whether it's gonna be a Crohn's disease or an ulcerative colitis or an irritable bowel syndrome, yes, there are genetic components with many of these, but major factor is inflammation in a person's diet that manifests in any number of different symptomatologies or diagnosable conditions that you can possibly think of. And the thing with this then is it means that through a process of trial and error, you need to figure out what is it that your body is reacting to. And I'm gonna give you a personal example, one that I have discovered over a period of probably 10 years. And just so that you again understand where I'm coming from, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian. My understanding is in the role of the nervous system in the upper neck. We'll be coming back around to that, so don't worry about that. But what I'm talking about here is just my own observations as a human being who's got a little bit of background in terms of nutritional science, who's able to understand some of these things, but I would not be able to begin to tell you the biochemical pathways associated with that. So I have a, a background in terms of having done a, a number of different uh, diets. I was uh, 15 years, uh, well, probably not quite 15 years, but we'll say about 10, 15 years of having a basically vegetarian, never full-blown vegan. Tried that for a little while, did uh, raw foods. Um, and it turned out that after a period of time, I had some blood work that was showing that my biomarkers were not in a happy place. My protein was down, my iron was down, 
Um, my um, electrolytes were completely out of whack. Now, this is a conversation for another time, um, but being honest, I also suffered from a eating disorder, uh, binge bulimia for 10 years. So when people talk about addiction, I get it, despite being, you know, what we would think of as hopefully a, a smart, intelligent person, we still do very irrational things when we become addicted to it. So we had that, which of course is not going to be a good thing and a healthy thing. But what I also did was a whole bunch of ultra running. So that also is going to have a, an impact on the body. And as much as we still love running along distances, we've had to scale back a little bit over a period of time. Point being, blood work is not good by any stretch of the imagination. And it is strongly advised to me that unless I want to go down the path of developing an autoimmune condition, that what I need to do is I need to make a radical change and reintroduce, amongst other things, meat. And so what did I do? That is exactly what I did because for all of the lovely, and I, I absolutely still stand by it, and I personally don't like it on the philosophical le levels, but nevertheless, you know, ethical where we come to a point of balance and understanding, I have to reintroduce meat into my diet. Now, what did I do? I reintroduced a whole bunch of eggs. Yes, I was still having, you know, some nuts, and I was having, you know, butter and cheeses and all of this sort of stuff. Basically, it was like a paleo or a keto protocol of sorts. And what did I do? Well, great, I'm supposed to be healthy. And what do I do? I put on the better part of uh, 10 to 20 pounds. That's not very fun. And it's not exactly like my energy goes up and I start feeling better and I start feeling healthier. And I'm thinking over a period of time, man, this sucks. And so what I do after, you know, giving it a real hard go for three to six months, you know what? I need some sugar. I need some soft drink back in me. I need to feel like a human being again here. So I start to slowly reintroduce, not necessarily junk food. Like I don't, I typically don't do well with breads or pastas or anything like that. Um, but I start shifting and becoming more of just a, the standard diet again. Now, let's fast forward over that period of time, because over that period of time, I'm nevertheless observing that when I eat rice, so if I'm going out having a little bit of Thai food or something like that, I start to feel a little bit bloated. And I noticed this a long while back, but it was that if I eat eggs, my thighs start to feel a little bit bigger, and I feel a little bit bigger around the midsection. Simply put, inflammation. And over that period of time, you know, ultimately somebody tells me, you know, okay, you know, consider the possibility of doing uh, like a dietary cleanse, whether intermittent fasting, which was really good. Um, but what I also tried was I figured, okay, well, I had heard about the concept of a carnivore diet. What's the concept right there? Concept there is simply put, you're only eating basically red meat, not even eggs. Well, I mean, you can have eggs and you can have cheeses and butters and all this sort of stuff. But because I had the question mark, you know what, maybe my body doesn't like eggs. So what I did was I basically went back to the exact same dietary protocol that I had done before that didn't work, that I gained all of this weight. But I said, okay, this time I'm not gonna eat eggs. I'm not gonna eat eggs, I'm not gonna eat chicken, we're just gonna go with beef, cheese, and then the rest is all the, the keto variety like that. And sure enough, in the span of about a month, I drop, you know, a better part of you know, five to 10 pounds without increasing my physical exercise whatsoever. So what's my point in telling you this story? I'm not telling you that, oh, you need to go out and do this diet and you need to go do this and you don't need to do what Jeff said her to do either. And again, because everybody's dietary circumstance is different, this is not advice here. I'm simply illustrating an example to you that an egg that in its nature is actually a good, healthy, nutritious food. In my body, my body doesn't like it. And as a result, if I put that into me, I'm gonna to start to feel more bloated. I start to feel that little bit more gross. And because now I'm aware and I'm paying attention to that, I know that for me, this is how I need to tailor my diet so that I am not going to be producing more inflammation, more irritation in my system so that I can ultimately be feeling as well as absolutely possible. And this then is what ultimately brings us around to, well, what's the connection with the upper part of the neck? 
And it's because you have a very, very important, not just nerve, but also the primary processing centers in your brain stem at the level right here. If you find and you see, I'm pointing at this little spot right behind your ear. It's called the C1, it's called the atlas vertebra. At that level are a cluster of cells in your brain stem. One of them is going to be called the nucleus tractus solitarius. Fancy word, what does that mean? It's the primary processing center for all of the visceral e afferent information that goes from your heart, lungs, digestive and reproductive systems up to your brain. In other words, it's the sensory, what is the state of our internal health? Is everything that we are digesting perfectly fine? Or danger, Will Robinson, danger, something is not going on and it's not behaving the way it should be. And so it's gonna transmit that information up to that part of your brain. But wait, there's more because in the exact same area, you also have something that's gonna be called the dorsal motor nucleus. Again, another fancy word. This is the parasympathetic general visceral efferent that sends those messages down from your brain via that vagus nerve to your heart, your lungs, your digestive and your reproductive system. So you've got wires, messages going down and also coming back up. And this is important because what it does is it produces a feedback loop in terms of your body function. It's going to be a case of, okay, if you're putting the good things in and if everything is working the way that it should be, awesome, gold in, gold out. But if on the other hand, you're putting garbage into the system, well, guess what? Garbage in and garbage out. And it's going to manifest in your symptomatology one way or another. And this is very important because again, when working with people with digestive issues, it's very important that you first look at all of the environmental factors that could be potentially affecting their digestive health. Now, after that, let's say on the other hand that what you have is you're a person who is pristine with your diet. Yeah, you might have a little bit of pizza or a little bit of odd McDonald's or the odd soft drink a little bit of chocolate, maybe a little bit more than we were supposed to, or the odd drink. We are human beings, be a human being. But these things are the exception to the rule. Overall, you do the right things. You sleep well, you exercise, you're aware of your stress levels, you do the best that you can, and you work to make sure that your diet is as good as you possibly can with the information that you have. But you still experience problems, you still experience issues. What is going on? What this suggests here, this kind of a scenario, is where something is interfering with the normal communication process between your brain and your digestive system. And because of what we understand of neurology, we would look then and say, okay, something is disrupting the vagus nerve most likely. Yes, there can be all kinds of other things but vagus nerve is a massive component in this case. So there's a couple things that you need to understand about vagus nerve. Number one is that when it leaves the base of your brain stem, what it actually does is it exits down through a little opening, kind of again, if you were to stick your finger between your ear and your jaw, right up in that area there, and it comes down along the very front of the top vertebrae in your neck, which are called the C1 or the atlas vertebra, and also the C2, which is called the axis vertebra. Now, this is the normal arrangement. There's no problem with anything that we're describing right here. But what's important to understand is that this particular area of our body is also a potential weak spot. So it doesn't have any discs, it doesn't have any interlocking joints, which normally hold or limit the overall amount of motion. It's what allows us to do 360 degrees of this. The problem then is if we've ever had a physical injury, whether that is a header off, a, basically a header off a bunk bed, you fall off your bike, you trip down the stairs, any number of sports injuries, car accidents, and then add to it, all of the repetitive stresses 
that you do in the course of growing up, including now, looking at computers, looking at your phones, all this. All of these have the tendency to cause that vertebra to misalign forwards, like I'm showing you like this. When that happens, characteristically what we see in people is that their head starts to stick forwards like this, and their head is not balanced on their neck or on their shoulders. And that's gonna start producing stress and tension that goes down into their body, and guess what, also into their nervous system. And especially if you've got that vagus nerve that's sitting right here, and then you've got that vertebra that's starting to slide forwards like this, it can be a source of mechanical tension or mechanical irritation, whether it's the nerve on the outside or if it's the processing centers that are actually going on on the inside. And so what you have is, yes, you would have, for example, the normal communication going up and down through the system like this, but if then it's down, or with static over a radio, where the message is not transmitting quite clearly, if the brain, your brain, is not receiving the right amount of information about what's actually going on with your digestive system, the output that it's sending is not gonna be appropriate for what it needs. And as a consequence, because of that feedback loop, it's ultimately, or at least has the potential to lead to a state of disrepair. And when that state of disrepair happens, that's when a person can and often does start to experience abnormal symptomatology associated with vagus nerve function. And this then is how your upper neck can be at least one of the contributing factors to the overall situation and story that's going on here. Now, there's actually something else that's probably worth, you know, important and pointing out here because a lot of times when people say, oh, I have digestive issues, I've had them, you know, pretty much all of my life. Well, a couple things to keep in mind is that, you know, we're talking about, you know, mechanical issues of the neck, right? Well, those kinds of injuries, very, very commonly, the first injury, first misalignment is actually going to happen during the birthing process itself. So during a normal, a normal delivery, the obstetrician typically is going to use around 60 to 90 pounds of force, which if you think about it, is an incredible amount of force on an infant's neck, which is so tiny and fragile. So if that misalignment happens, that then can start to disrupt things from day dot. And you may have heard of a condition that's called colic. All babies are going to cry, but there is inconsolable, unrelenting crying. And this is believed to be to a number of different factors, but the true cause is not fully known. But what a good chunk of the research shows is that people, or more appropriately, newborns and infants, who are colicky, that they have a much greater likelihood of experiencing migraines when they get older. So a couple of things, and this takes us back to vagus nerve function. I told you about the vagus nerve in terms of the transmissions to and from your brain about heart, lungs, digestive, reproductive system. Well, guess what? Your vagus nerve also transmits the sensory information about what's going on to the inside neurons and the connective tissue around the base of your brain stem and on the inside of your skull. And so if there is irritation, again, to or from those messages of vagus nerve, that can produce pain. And in addition, if you were to have, say, a genuine digestive issue, and it starts to overload your neural circuitry, transmitting via that vagus nerve, well, guess what? It can also trip, and your brain can start to mishmash some of the signals, and as a consequence of, for example, you eating something, or you drinking something, or you inhaling something or smelling something, you get the idea, it triggers a migraine in you. That's because something is overloading your vagus nerve circuitry is the short of it. So even though we oftentimes think for people who experience migraines, in migraines in particular, and I mean no matter what flavor you're talking about, whether it's a classic migraine, typical migraine, atypical migraine, dietary or abdominal migraine, vestibular migraine, ocular migraine, these are all names of end products. They're symptoms. What's the cause? And oftentimes people think, oh, the food was the cause. The food is not usually the cause. I mean, if you eat or drink too much alcohol, 
and you got a hangover, yeah, that was the cause. But if it was only a low dose of something, it's like, man, this should not be making me feel, you know, so awful like this. Then most likely what's happened is that something is affecting your vagus nerve function and it's setting you up a sensitivity. It's a trigger. This is the normal amount of stress that your body can handle. But if you've got this mechanical injury in your neck, your bucket of stress is lower. Your body can only tolerate this much before, boom, everything blows out, whether in terms of indigestion, abdominal symptoms, any number of different pathologies, again, that you can think of, leaning into not just the endocrine, but also some of the immunological things that are associated with the digestive tract, but then also migraines in particular as a major link. So what is my point in sharing you all of this, not just describing you know, where and how the, the neurology is linked in this particular regard? What I'm illustrating here for you is that if, 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 firstly, you've always got to make sure that your diet is as good as you possibly can and that you've looked at the different factors and you've chatted with the appropriate healthcare professional to find out what is most appropriate for you. Now, after that, if you're doing all the right things and yet you are still experiencing so many of these different issues, guess what? It means it's very possible that you have interference to how your body is normally able to function. It's affecting how you feel. And especially then, if you also experience any other symptoms that we associate, normally associate with the neck, the headaches, shoulder pain, and or migraines especially, guess what? That is a telltale sign that this is very likely contributing in one way or another. It may only be 10%, but it could also be 90% of the overall problem. Ergo, very important when people are experiencing some of these digestive issues that you never, ever, ever rule out the relationship about what's going on in this part of your body. Because again, if that goes out, one of the reasons that people are gonna feel so yucky, pre-migraining and they start to feel sick. It's not always your digestive symptom. Where you feel the problem is not always where the problem is coming from. So important to keep that in mind. Look at your diet, but also never forget to look at your vagus nerve function and as a major component of that, looking at the overall health of the alignment, motion, stability of your neck. So thank you guys for watching this little video. Hope that that gives you a little bit more explanation about what the, the connection is between your neck and also to digestion and some of the infinite number of things that those of us in the healthcare arena are always trying to help you out with. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, number one, we'd always have you like it, subscribe to the channel because it helps the YouTube algorithm know that people actually like this so that it helps other people who need this information find it. Number two is if we've talked about somebody who you know in your life who would benefit from hearing that, please share this video with them. And then number three is if you are somebody who's actually experiencing these kinds of things, you've been from specialist to specialist, and you're wondering, is it possible that something in my neck could actually be related to what I'm experiencing? And I wanna be better, and I wanna be healthy, and I wanna do whatever it takes to do that. Then what we're gonna have you do is we're gonna have you reach out to us. You go check out our website, which is uppercervicalspokane.com, and it'll give you all of the information that you need in order to get in touch with us. We'll be happy to have a, a chat with you in person and come up with a solution for you if we think that we are able to help you out. So again, as always, your attention. We hope that you enjoyed this, uh, this video. We really appreciate it. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna from uh, Upper Cervical Spokane wishing you the very best. Take care. Be well, stay well, live well. Bye now.